All right, we will get started. Uh, let folks uh, filter in here from lunch as we get going. Uh, we're going to give you a little update on where we stand with JRuby, uh, how things are looking compatibility performance wise, and uh, how we're getting ready to prepare uh, to, to support Ruby 2.6 and, and Rails 6 as well. Uh, we are the JRuby guys, the JRuby co leads. We've been working on this full time for 11, 12 years now. Uh, kind of amazing that we've had sponsors like Red Hat that have been willing to keep this uh, project going. Um, in the past, we were very happy to have Sun Microsystems and Engine Yard also fund a lot of our efforts. So we're really excited about uh, being able to continue to work on this. Uh, a little aside before we continue on, I don't know how many of you have heard about this. Uh, a, a good friend of ours, one of the earliest contributors to JRuby, JRuby on Rails may not have happened without him. Uh, he has been working in Ecuador for the past few years. He was a, a friend of Julian Assange's, and apparently that's enough for them to have arrested him and hauled him away. Uh, he's on a 90-day pretrial detention right now, and they have, there's no evidence. It's really a horrible, illegal holding of uh, a good friend of ours. So search for Free Oral Albini on Twitter. There are some, uh, some support, supporting groups and, and, and fundraisers to try and get the word out about our friend that has been held by the Ecuadorian government. All right, so what is JRuby? Um, I'm guessing most folks here probably have some pretty good idea of what JRuby is. Uh, but it, it's really just Ruby. We always try to emphasize that we want JRuby to be as much a drop-in replacement for CRuby as we possibly can. Uh, we try to keep compatibility solid. We try to make sure all the pure Ruby gems work well. Where there's extensions, we try to make sure we have a JRuby version. We want to be a Ruby implementation. But we are also a, a JVM language. We have the benefits of being on top of the JVM and all of the access to that, the power of great garbage collectors, native JITs, and everything else. Um, so I'll just go over the roadmap of uh, where we're at in JRuby. On the master branch, we uh, have our 9.2 series, and it supports Ruby 2.5. Last week, it seems like a month, but last week, we put out 9.2.7. Charlie, I'll talk about one feature that came with 9.2.7. Um, next month, we plan on 9.2.8, um, and Charlie will talk about two features for that coming up. Uh, we decided to retire uh, JRuby 9.1. This was our 2.3 support. And we have a, a Ruby 2.6 branch. And so now what we're wondering is should we put out Ruby 2.6 support or should we wait for the next significant uh, release, which I think is still going to be 2.7. Uh, we actually have a precedent for this. Uh, we skipped Ruby 2.4 and we didn't really have uh, many complaints. And the reason why we want this is we want to be able to spend more time enhancing and making JRuby better. Having multiple support branches uh, is a lot of work. OK, so some of the things that we've been working on recently. Uh, in the uh, JRuby 927 time frame here, we have finally gone back and done a whole great, a great deal of work to get refinements working well. Uh, started to see them popping up in the wild more often, started to see them in key libraries that we intend to support. Uh, so it was, it was really uh, necessary for us to, to catch this up. Uh, so the good news then is that in JRuby 927, which we released a couple weeks ago, uh, refinements are pretty much 100%. Uh, there are a few errors here on the CRuby test refinement script. Uh, but they're, they're odd ca edge cases, like if you're doing refinements and you're explicitly undefing methods or weird cases that almost no one ever does. We'll get those, those fixed up, but for the release, we were uh, in the 99% range of, of compatibility with refinements. So, yay, a lot of work, but it, we, we got there with that. Uh, we've also done some work on improving uh, enumerators and fibers, uh, specifically enumerator.next, which also uses fibers under the cover. Uh, up until uh, the nine, up until the 928 release that's going to be coming up, uh, Enumerator had its kind of its own implementation of a fiber. It had some bugs. It was a little too eager, and it would would pull the next value off of a collection uh, before it should. Uh, so that's all fixed now. The new Enumerator is just built on top of fibers, like it is in C Ruby. We are working on doing more support, uh, more work to uh, reduce the overhead of fibers. Uh, specifically, we're looking at this new project from the OpenJDK uh, group called Loom, Project Loom, which brings real native coroutines and fibers to the JVM. 
Uh, this should allow us to be able to spin up thousands, hundreds of thousands of fibers just like you can on CRuby uh, without having to back each of them with a native thread. So uh, hopefully that will become a standard feature of uh, the JVM soon. Uh, the final big project that we've been working on recently uh, is a reboot and rewrite of how all of our internal load and require logic works. Um, this is driven in part by a desire for a little bit better startup time. Um, we're doing a little more too much work when the, the, doing the file searching for requires and such. Uh, there's a cache that was built into CRuby many years ago that sped them way up. We never had gotten around to implementing a similar cache in JRuby. Um, also, uh, projects like Zeitwork that are doing an excellent job of finally bringing more formalized, uh, uh, robust code loading and reloading to Ruby applications uh, depends on some of the features in auto load and elsewhere that really uh, need to be fixed up a little bit in JRuby. So this hopefully will be 9.2.8. Um, with RailsConf, it's, it's going to take a little bit of time for, away from working on this, but within the next two releases or so, we should have all of the required load issues fixed. It should be fast. Everything in Zeitwork should be good. Uh, so that's coming up real soon here. Okay, so one of the biggest reasons that uh, people have trouble adopting JRuby has always been our startup time issues. Uh, like I say, we want to try and be a drop-in replacement for CRuby. We support the same command line tools, we support the same server frameworks and all of that, and we want to support the same developer, uh, the developer flow, the, what you're used to doing, your methodology and your tools. And that's really difficult when we have a startup time issue. Uh, applications take longer to get going, uh, running quick uh, migrations, rake tasks takes much longer in JRuby. So we're working, we continuously for the past 12 years, we've been working on trying to improve startup time. Uh, this is going to be kind of a, a state of the art for where we are right now. So why is this such a difficult problem for us? Well, if you look at CRuby, all of the code that's running when you start booting up an application, I mean, aside from the rail, the, the actual Ruby code that, that starts running itself, it's all written in C. The parser is in C, the compiler to instruction sequences is in C, the uh, interpre interpreter for those instruction sequences, almost all of the core class methods, it's all hot, it's all fast C code already. So there's nothing to warm up. You contrast that with JRuby running on the JVM, Everything starts out cold. Everything starts out as JVM bytecode. The JVM has to interpret that. Eventually, that will turn into native code. Uh, so as, if we run JRuby and do these things, uh, do startup-like tasks multiple times in the same JVM, we speed way up. It's not really that there's a, a problem with JRuby itself. It's just kind of the nature of running on the JVM. Things take a little bit longer to get up and going. Um, and we need to, we're working on various ways to get around this. Uh, so here's kind of a, a, a few series of, of graphs to kind of show where we stand compared to CRuby. This is dash V. I mean, this isn't really a particularly useful one. You can see we're under 0.2 seconds here. Uh, but, you know, in, in every case, CRuby is considerably faster at doing these things because it's been optimized for startup time. Uh, here, if we, uh, ooh, this, oh, this sequence changed. I lost a slide. Um, okay, so, so if we go to something a little bit more, uh, um, s more severe, uh, we've got a gem list here. And uh, this is actually doing a gem list of a, a, a local repository for JRuby. Wait, I'm going to have to fix something here. We, we... All right, so that was dash V. Um, now this is a, a little bit more. Now we're actually starting up the JRuby runtime, the Ruby execution code, just to run uh, the literal one integer. Uh, now we start to show that we're, we're really starting to fall behind here. Booting up JRuby itself, booting up the parts of JRuby that are written in Ruby, all of this stuff starts out so cold that we're coming up well over uh, like a half, one and a half seconds here to get to just a, a dash E1 at the command line. Uh, and, and here also you can see this is JRuby. Uh, in the green there is just the first time running it cold at the command line. If I set it up to run dash E1 10 times in the same JVM, it gets faster than CRuby. Uh, so the JIT in the JVM actually does catch up and does a great job of optimizing this stuff, but it's not there for that first run, which is the most important one for startup time. Uh, examples of some more uh, uh, interesting uh, benchmarks here. This is doing just a gem version. So this will load up parts of, all the parts of Ruby gems that need to be there uh, and then give you the version information. Or doing a gem list, in this case on uh, my local JRuby install, which was about 350 gems. I just pointed out uh, all the implementations at that. This takes a big hit for us, uh, loading up all this information. I'll just add that gem list is sort of our worst case because nothing will JIT. 
Because it's mostly just doing a, a huge set of evals. Right, right. So it won't even JIT at the JRuby level. So it's our interpreter running on top of the JVM's interpreter. This stuff is all really cold and it takes a while to get going. But we, as you see again, the 10th iteration here almost starts to get down to where CRuby is. Um, we're going to try and find ways to get the JVM to pre-optimize that in the future. Uh, kind of showing that same, same process here, chem list with uh, 10 runs within the same JVM, it speeds up significantly. So we're kind of fighting against the JVM a bit here. Uh, over the years, we've had various ways of, of working around this, though. Uh, one of the ways that we do this is by disabling our own JIT and uh, passing some tweaks to the, the JVM. Uh, that drops our time down to be a little bit more acceptable. Uh, code isn't going to run as fast, obviously, but for quick command line operations, this is probably the first line of attack to get JRuby startup time better, to patch this dash dash dev flag, uh, which just disables some optimizations. Uh, Here's another example of, I'm running on Java 11. Java 11 with some new features for uh, the Java platform, uh, it causes us to start up even slower. They're not caching as much information. We can't uh, av avoid some of the boot time uh, overhead of the JVM. Uh, but if we pass dash dash dev, we start to get that back down again. And if we use a feature called class data store, uh, class data sharing, which allows the JVM to pre-boot parts of JRuby before uh, every, every command, uh, we can get a little bit more out of it. Uh, OpenJ9 is a, a new open source JVM from IBM. Uh, it's actually been around for many years as a closed source JVM. Uh, but it comes with this uh, quick start mode which transparently in the background between runs will save off not just the code and the, the class files and, and the class data information from your application, but the jitted code as well. So it gets us much closer to being able to actually boot up uh, almost full speed once we, once we actually run the command. Uh, so you run it a couple times, it starts to, to know what the code is and optimizes it and caches it in the background. So if we look at all of our best times here, uh, we're still definitely not looking as good as CRuby on a larger task like GemList, uh, but we're in the neighborhood of maybe three, three and a half times slower at this point. Uh, there's more that we're going to be doing. Uh, one of the things we're, we're talking about, uh, I've also mentioned that we're trying to find a way to get the JVM to pre-optimize this. Uh, we're interested as well in ahead of time compiling JRuby so that we can have all that code be native right away and boot up and run fast. Uh, Truffle Ruby is actually using this to, to some effect, some pretty good effect, uh, on top of the Grawl substrate VM. Uh, what they're able to do is take the core of Truffle Ruby, compile it down to a native binary, and then that, obviously, it avoids that cold start for a certain portion of the execution. Uh, in their case, uh, as in ours, you, once you get Ruby code and C extensions booting up, though, that actually has a little bit more overhead. So we'll take a look at how this looks. Uh, so just comparing with Truffle Ruby here, you can see this is the, this is the sort of improvement that we really would like to get out of an ahead of time compilation. Uh, their dash V numbers, again, not, not a particularly interesting one, is definitely down in the C Ruby range. Uh, I believe the dash E1 numbers are almost as fast as C Ruby, maybe not quite. Uh, it's, it's right in the same neighborhood though. Uh, so this looks great. We want to be able to start using ahead of time compilation to, to optimize JRuby in the same way. Uh, unfortunately, the, the way that things are set up in Truffle Ruby, that only really helps that first like one second of startup. It gets rid of the, the coldness of the runtime itself. Uh, once you start loading up gems, loading up larger applications, there's still startup time problems. We, we, our op these optimizing VMs take longer to get up and going, um, and we're going to try and work with the Graal VM folks and find a better way to pre-optimize JRuby and the Ruby code altogether. So futures for this. Uh, we always keep working on trying to reduce the complexity at our boot time, which is kind of the, the only thing we can do in the JRuby side of things. We are starting to look into these new improvements to the JVM, like this class data storing, the quick start mode in OpenJ9. Uh, we'll continue to play with those and tweak things. Uh, we're gonna try and pre-compile more of JRuby and the Ruby code we boot to, uh, down to native uh, so that we can take advantage of things like Graal VM. Uh, there's a lot of work to do here, but this, this could be very promising in the future. I'm hoping within the next year or so, we'll be able to show a pre-compiled JRuby plus all of the Ruby code booting up large applications in a very short period of time. So this, this may be solved within the next year here. 
Okay, so JRuby on Rails is really the, the, the more interesting part of, uh, of our story here. Uh, so why is JRuby on Rails really interesting? Uh, well, I actually had a couple people here ask me, are there, anybody, are there any people running JRuby with Rails in production? And there are actually many, many companies that are run, running JRuby, some at, at really high scales, uh, 30, 40, 50 machine clusters, uh, governments, banks, uh, there's some, some applications at the BBC that are used for election results that use some Rails stuff in the background. So there's lots of places in the world that are running JRuby on Rails, especially in larger government or financial or corporate environments where they need something that fits into a, an existing Java infrastructure or a, a managed runtime infrastructure. Um, and we've been running Rails since 2006. That was really the first thing that showed us JRuby could be pretty cool. We got a lot of potential with this. Uh, so. What you get when you run JRuby on Rails is a lot of the stuff that, that CRuby is still trying to, to really work on and improve. You get really excellent garbage collection. You get native parallel threading. Uh, you get the native JIT. Uh, so generally, you're going to see better performance. You're going to see better use of resources and much easier to scale out, especially as applications get very large. So we'll take a look at a couple different scale, uh, different sizes of applications here. Uh, so first of all, what does it take for, for scaling Rails? So this is a classic problem with CRuby. Uh, back before we had nice pre-forking, uh, clustering servers, it was very difficult to get all of the CPU cores in the system to be, to be lit up, to actually be used by a CRuby-based application. Without any concurrent threads, you had to spin up separate processes, you had to duplicate at least some amount of runtime state. The copy on write stuff helps part of that, but if your application's large enough and busy enough, eventually those heaps grow right back up. And you're, you've got multiple garbage collectors, multiple heaps, it really ends up wasting resources at that point. Uh, we believe that JRuby is really the answer to this. You can have a single multi-threaded process run your entire site. Uh, you know, four cores, eight cores, 16, 32, as large as you want to go, a single JRuby process with very little increase in memory size will cover that whole machine. So why not, you can spin up two if you want, you know, two for twice the price, uh, but you really can saturate an entire system with just one JRuby instance. Um, and that's very difficult to do uh, with CRuby. Uh, so in the first uh, set of Rails performance benchmarks I've got here, uh, we're just going to be doing a simple scaffolded blog application. So this is a full stack Rails app. It's very simple, it's a trivial sort of full stack app, but it's going all the way to the database, bringing results back to the front end. Uh, I'm running this on a real system, a, a T2 extra large on uh, EC2 uh, with a recent Ubuntu. Uh, recent or current versions of CRuby and JRuby. Uh, we also did do some, some numbers with, with Truffle Ruby we'll show here. Uh, and we were, we've kind of gone back and forth between the WRK uh, web driver and the AB Apache Bench driver. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the issues we've had later. Okay, now we're really, th this is what we've been spending a lot of time on over the past couple months. Optimizing for Rails is very important. This is the killer app for Ruby even today. And if you can't run Rails fast and you can't run it well, you're not going to be a competitive Ruby and, and you, you might have other, other areas you can work on, but Rails is really still the big ticket for Ruby. Uh, it's also a very difficult framework to optimize. If we can get Rails to run fast, it means we've got a, a wide breadth of optimizations that we've managed to put in place. There are so many difficult pieces of Rails. Uh, even in, in modern, cleaned up, uh, not quite so magic Rails, it, it takes a lot of work. Uh, so JRuby typically ran these a little bit slower. Uh, up until recently, we've over the past year or so, we've started to see that JRuby is convincingly faster on real-world Rails applications. Uh, so here is just the simple blog post with the title, apparently. Title. Uh, this is just the scaffolded blog post view. Uh, and you can see here that JRuby is now starting to go faster for this simple application. Uh, largely on an application this small, what we'd hope is that mostly this is going to be active record and database overhead in the background, and that's kind of why these numbers end up coming out pretty close together. Uh, we are running the inners of ra in, in, inner parts of Rails much better, uh, but you know we're getting an improvement. It's not huge yet. We're just starting to look at this performance. Uh, here, Truffle Ruby, they're, they're doing a lot of great work on optimization of smaller benchmarks. Uh, I'm sure that they're going to continue to improve these numbers too. Uh, so now some caveats for this benchmark and some of the other ones coming up. Uh, we've had issues with getting the various uh, benchmark driver tools to keep alive, do key HTTP keep alive properly. 
uh, which ends up skewing the results depending on which way you go. You can turn keep alive off, then you're creating new connections all the time. There's issues with benchmarking that and socket starvation and so on. If you turn keep alive on, we've found that there are bugs in Puma and possibly other places within Ruby that prevents keep alive from always working properly. Um, so largely what we've done with these, with these benchmarks is we turn keep alive off to try and keep it an even playing field for everybody. Uh, and that at least gives us a, a better idea of what the comparative numbers would be. Uh, also, I, I know the truffle numbers were kind of, were, were pretty low here. I got, there were some really strange results when I was running truffle Ruby. Every time I would spin up uh, a round of uh, requests, the Truffle Ruby server would sit there for another several minutes at about 150% CPU, consuming like two gig of memory, and I have no idea what it was doing. So I wouldn't, don't take too much from these numbers. There's obviously more work to be done there, and something strange is happening that uh, we'll, we'll, have to, uh, we'll let the Truffle Ruby guys know about that. Um, okay, and resident memory here. So this is the other thing that comes out of having a single JRuby process that can actually drive your entire system. Even with copy on write, CRuby instances are going to stack up pretty quickly. Uh, and every time you've got an additional chunk of memory, it's going to add up. If you want five instances, 10, 50, 100, uh, now you're talking about some serious hardware and spending a lot of money on whatever server provider you're using. With JRuby, uh, here I say the default settings, the JVM will try to eat up as much memory as it, it wants to, but this particular application ran fine when I capped the heap size to 250 megabytes. Uh, the, whole, the total process rose to around 500 to 600 meg, uh, and that is all that would be needed then to saturate an enormous server. A 32 core server could still run with this 500 meg or so of JRuby uh, and use all the cores and use all the resources. So, it's pretty promising for larger scale applications. Uh, we never say that JRuby is the automatic option, but once you, get, once you get to this scale, it might be the thing you need to look at. Okay, so we wanted to do something a little bit more real than a blog application. Um, so we decided to go and benchmark rubygems.org, the website. Uh, unfortunately, due to um, some issues benchmarking, um, we didn't make it as far as we had hoped. So this benchmark was running on my laptop, which is an i7 machine with 16 gigs of memory. Um, obviously, we ran it in production mode. I didn't want to do a self-signed uh, certificate, so I turned off HTTPS. From a relative comparison standpoint, this shouldn't really make a difference. But everything was running on one machine and there's quite a few servers uh, that have to be set up to run rubygems.org. And obviously the client software is running there as well. Uh, so the, it didn't actually take that much work to get this running. It just pretty much worked on JRuby. It was just the weird things about trying to set it up in production locally. Um, but the very first thing I did is I made a user and I'm like, I'm gonna benchmark the user um, since I had it. So I started benchmarking the profile and then I fell down this big rabbit hole. Um, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, I could not do a gem push. I did try that quickly. And I think it's because I was using Toxy proxy and not S3, but I'm not sure. But anyways, um, I'm gonna share at least the profile part of this today. Uh, in benchmarking, no matter what I tried to do, the WRK tool would never show an improvement with more concurrent requests going to the web server. And I knew this clearly wasn't true for JRuby, so it was lying to me. Um, so then I switched over to AB, but I wanted to use Keep Alive. As soon as I did that, everything just exploded. And so our big discovery on Wednesday, Wednesday was that Keep Alive has been broken on Puma for two years. Or no, a year and two months. Yeah. At least. And we're, we're not fully sure of the details of this yet, but I can tell you that Keep Live is not working. So, yeah, so this is going to be something we'll fix. For, we're we're going to work to fix right away when we get home. Um, so in this first graph, uh, we're using WRK. We're only using one thread. And what I discovered 20 minutes ago, thanks to Noah being here, is that WRK uses a reactor. And just because it has one thread, doesn't mean it won't throw out 10 requests at once. It uses the number of connections. Um, so 
If we look at this green line first, this is C Ruby running in clustered mode with 20 workers. Uh, it uh, has a pretty nice number, but it looks super erratic. It's very strange. So uh, if we look down at the next uh, uh, set of numbers, the yellow line is uh, C Ruby running in single mode with 20 threads. And you can see just a very consistent number of requests per second, so it's not erratic. Um, but the difference between the green and the yellow line is mostly because I didn't understand how WRK worked. So it's actually probably sending 8, 10 requests at a time, and we're actually seeing it scaling out across multiple C Ruby processes. If we actually look at the JRuby uh, line, uh, you can see at the beginning for the first six or seven iterations, these are 30 seconds apiece. This is how long it took to actually warm up on JRuby to get the profile towards, towards a peak performance, and then it levels out. But as I said, uh, Puma has this issue with Keep Alive, so I decided this morning to rerun these again and turn off Keep Alive. And so the first thing you'll notice is that uh, the C Ruby clustered mode no longer is erratic and it's behaving properly. Uh, interesting, uh, MRI's uh, single mode didn't really change at all. And then you can see that JRuby now is fairly convincingly uh, topping out over um, MRI. So here's a totally different set of uh, uh, measurements. Uh, across the x-axis is running AB with a different number of concurrent requests going to the web servers. Yeah, so it's showing scaling out, basically. And these numbers that are represented are their peaks. So um, again, on the, on the yellow line is C Ruby running single with 20 threads. Uh, I only went out to 14 uh, concurrent requests. You can see it's pretty much level, but it is actually kind of drooping. As time goes on, uh, yeah. there's a global interpreter lock, so. Right, the more threads you have, the more time is wasted bouncing around between those threads that can't run concurrently. So more threads in C Ruby often does slow things down, as, as Noah has found as well. Um, you can see that in clustered mode, uh, which would be how you typically do it in MRI, um, there's a nice scaling curve there. I'll say somewhere between eight and 10, I was using 100% of CPU on my laptop all the time. Uh, so it used it up good. Uh, I'd say the big takeaway here is on JRuby does better because using threads versus processes are just lighter. So we, we scale out better. So uh, let's change topics a little bit. Most of you probably have a C Ruby uh, Rails application, and if you wanted to move to JRuby, what would you do? Um, I've been trying to make discourse run on JRuby, so I'm going through this activity right now. Um, it's a massive uh, Rails application. 250,000 lines of Ruby is a lot of code. Um, over 500 gems. If we can make this run, any application can run on JRuby. And in fact, it does run right now, except for one small bug. The actual forum pages don't render because there's a JavaScript problem not converting Markdown to HTML. But one, one problem weighs so close for this talk. Um, but anyways, the first thing that you're gonna do when you wanna convert your application is you're gonna install the JRuby lint gem um, and then you're gonna go into your application and you're just gonna run it. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna generate a report for you. Um, the first thing that it'll do is it'll look at your gem file and then it'll point out, oh, I see it's using fast XOR. Maybe you wanna go and use Exorcist. Hmm. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the uh, hints for that come from this wiki page. So if you actually know that there's a replacement gem and going through this activity, you can go and update this wiki page. And please be nice. <laughs> um, Another thing that this tool does is static analysis. Um, the f most common thing that you'll see is or equals as a pattern that you need to investigate. 
In most cases, uh, you're probably only gonna do this once, but if two threads try to hit an or equals at the same time, you're probably not gonna get the result you want. And that, that applies to CRuby as well. CRuby can get different results two threads get to an or equals at the same time. It's not guaranteed to be an atomic operation. It seems to be happily, accidentally happy though. Mm. Um, we'll report things that we don't support at all, like fork. Uh, we'll report things that no one should ever be using that's slower on JRuby, like optic space. But uh, of course, after you go through this report, then you just have to try to do a bundle install. And what you may see or you may not see is that not all uh, the gems had replacements and you're gonna hit an error like this because it's in, we don't support C extensions. So let's go through some strategies. The first one is maybe this isn't that important to you. So you can just go and add a uh, platform tag, bypass it. And there are a few of these that come by default with Rails that are essentially just disabled on JRuby. Um, we're trying to get more and more of those supported, but you know, that's how it is. Yeah. Uh, another thing you can do is just write pure Ruby. Uh, you can, XOR is pretty trivial there. Of course, if XOR is really important to you, you might realize that you do want a native extension. Another strategy, although this hasn't come into play for discourse, uh, is to use foreign function interface. FFI gives you the ability to bind to a dynamic library and call the methods and functions on it, even interact with the structs, and you get to do it all with the Ruby syntax. So here's just a, a snippet to give you an idea. Um, you make a module, you include the smarts of FFI here. This gives you methods like FFI lib, which um, will actually bind to the DLL and then you're gonna do a series of attach functions for each function you wanna call on it. And then you just provide its name, its input parameters, and its return type. But then once you get done doing that, then you can just call it like it's Ruby. And this is portable across Ruby implementations, so it's, it's a good option in that way. JRuby has a, a feature that allows you to go and interact with Java classes and objects as if they're Ruby classes and objects. Um, and there's like an infinite number of Java libraries out there that you can use. So pretty much anything you'll need. And you'll tend to just write a small amount of glue code around a Java library to go and make, make a port of a gem. In fact, I'm working on a uh, port of Mini Racer. This is a small set of bindings to the V8 runtime that Discourse uses. Uh, I found a library J2V8, and someone wrote a bunch of C bindings to expose V8 to Java, and then I'm using Ruby scripting to <laughs> consume those Java classes, so that's pretty weird, but it works great. Here's just a little what that looks like. Uh, you load the jar you wanna use, you import the class, V8 in this case, Constructor runtime, just start using it. And in fact, on this bottom um, line, you'll see execute underscore script. This is actually execute script with a capital letter, but JRuby goes and gives you this extra alias to make things nicer. The last, uh, but certainly not least, uh, method for replacing a gem is to write a Java native extension. This is an analog to uh, Ruby C extensions, but with our own API. This takes the most work out of all the strategies, but it also gives you the best performance. I've been porting OJ now for I don't know how long, but it's, 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 it's very close. It's down to like 20 errors. Um, but it's 20,000 lines of C, and uh, uh, it has pretty much every feature you could ever want for interacting with JSON. So it's, it's a pretty sophisticated library. And it's increasingly becoming a uh, very popular uh, transitive dependency. Just to give you an idea of what this looks like in the Java code, we'll use an annotation to specify this is the OJ module. And then we'll use another annotation specifying that this is a Ruby method. It's a module method. 
it required one requires one argument, but rest is true, so it can take any extra arguments. And then uh, it's called strict load. It's the same as a Java name, and a bunch of Java code that no one cares about. Um, so, arguably, it is painful when you run into one of these cases. You'll have to employ one of these strategies to make your application work. Uh, the silver lining in this is that over time, people have undertaken all the big gems and, and already made this port. So once it's done once, uh, we all get it. So yay for open source. We've been very happy that more and more gem authors are releasing JRuby support at the same time as CRuby. So we're finally, finally seeing that happen. So how well do we run uh, Rails itself? Yeah. Uh, for 5.2.3, we're almost 5.9s. Uh, there's a, a, a couple of issues in running tests. Um, for Action Cable itself, you'll see in Rails 6, we only fail like 10 tests there. But uh, it's nearly perfect. And in fact, if we actually look at the errors we do have, they're <laughs> really trivial, weird things. This is actually something we just need to submit a PR to Rails for. It should be doing a delta, not doing an exact float comparison. Boo. Uh, we have our own uh, project for active record support, active record JDBC. It's green because it's our project, but we do exclude several tests. A bunch of weird tests that fail again, like uh, historical dates going over a boundary. Uh, there's some PG-specific adapter tests that are very useful for us, but uh, some of them are we're not interested in. We just need to submit to the to active record didn't um, close those out. Uh, if we look at Rails 6, uh, it's not out yet. Um, we do a little bit worse, but we do quite well still. Um, in the effort of speeding this up, I won't cover that as much. Uh, and Daniel Wrights, one of our uh, contributors, has been keeping Active Record up to date almost in real time. And so thank you, Daniel. Uh, You'll see there's probably 40 more excludes. Um, so we still have some stuff to work through, but I've run several um, apps with Rails 6, and I've noticed no problems at all. All right, so wrapping up in the last couple minutes here. Uh, would love for anybody to try it if you haven't given it a shot. Uh, you can go to jruby.org and download it and get other information, links to everything you need. Uh, we want to always thank all the many different companies and users out there. Um, NASA's got uh, stuff running JRuby. Uh, there's a part of the SETI at Home project. JRuby's used to coordinate some radio telescopes. I mentioned the BBC. Of course, and we've got a lot of stuff in Ruby at, at Red Hat that we're trying to get on JRuby, too. So there are lots of folks out there building large applications on JRuby. Um, we'd love for you to be uh, part of that family, too. Uh, and uh, we can close it out and have maybe one question here. Thanks very much. Right. Any questions? 50 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> There's no pressure. Um, maybe this is a really silly question, but I never quite understood why there's two implementations on the JVM. And it sounds like you'll be the person about to answer that question. So why does JRuby and Truffle Ruby exist? Why not just like one? And there was a third implementation oh, at really? one time. Okay. Yeah, there was. There was an XRuby as well years ago. Uh, well, so, so JRuby's been around for the longest time. We, our focus is very specifically on being the, the, the JVM Ruby, uh, which means that we can not just, we can run on Hotspot, the standard OpenJDK JVM, but we can also run on OpenJ9. We can run on HP's VMs, on their weird systems. So we can run on anywhere that claims that they are anything like a JVM. That's what we've always focused on. Um, the Truffle Ruby project is, is doing great stuff, but it depends on one very specific runtime that's not, not going to work on other JVMs, uh, at least any time in the near future. Well, it, so that's re it really ends up being pretty different, and that's one of the reasons that the two projects kind of grew apart. And, and it, it, can, it can run on other JVMs. It's just not going to run. Yeah, it's performance-wise. It needs the, needs the specific runtime to really, to really work out. So that's pretty much it. But different people want to make different, a better mousetrap, so. Yeah. yeah, different tools for different purposes. All right, and uh, it looks like we are over time, so please grab us after the talk if you have any questions. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>